Reese Hoskins continues to be the center of attention at City Field, and the Mets comeback came up a little short. I'll break down everything from Saturday's game on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Reese Hoskins cannot get out of town soon enough. He killed the Mets on Saturday and just is so Damn annoying. We're going to talk about the comeback and we're going to talk about Sevy's performance, but I want to start on Hoskins because he was the story of the day. He goes three for four, drives in four, hits a home run, and he's at the center of controversy once again. So I get why Mets fans and the broadcast booth wanted to see the Mets send a message early. And ultimately, they sent a message way too late. And that's in the seventh inning where Johan Ramirez throws behind Reese Hoskins back and gets ejected for it. But I want to go back to that first at bat because this is where everyone's saying the Mets missed their opportunity to buzz one on Hoskins, let him know, and then everything could have been different. Let's walk through that inning. Luis Severino making his first start in the Mets uniform. He strikes out the leadoff batter, gets a weekly hit ground ball to third base. Zach Short should have fielded it cleanly, might have had a play on William Contreras. He boots it. They rule it a hit, not an error, which I think was a mistake. And that was the first base runner for the Brewers. First of 12 hits that Severino would give up. Christian Yelich then gets a hit where he just flares one to left field, barely even hits it too hard. It was 64 miles per hour up the bat. Just uh, a hit that found some grass. Willie Adamas doubles, so that scores the first run of the game. You have runners at second and third, one out. Jake Bowers comes up, and Seve strikes him out too. So now he's got two outs. Two runners in scoring position. First base open. Hoskins up. And behind him is Oliver Dunn. uh, Not necessarily a a feared bat in that lineup. Played some great defense at third throughout the game, but still. Yes. In theory, hit Reese Hoskins there. Base is loaded. Maybe Severino strikes out Dunn. And all of a sudden, you don't give up those extra two runs in the first inning. Maybe Seve's even more confident, doesn't give up runs later. Maybe Hoskins doesn't hit that two-run homer in the third. And the Mets might win their first game of the season, or their first, might get their first win of the season, I should say. Here's the problem. If Luis Severino hits Reese Hoskins, how do you know they're not going to eject him? Chances are they will eject Luis Severino. And then even though you could say, oh, well, he gave up all those runs, you don't know that in the first inning. What you've seen in the first inning is Severino had gotten two strikeouts and a couple soft hit balls that fell. And then, of course, the double that was hit a little bit better. But still, it's not like you knew in that first inning that he didn't have it. And it's not like you were in any position to say, yeah, let's just get rid of him. Let's get him off the mat. Let's just let's use him to be in Hoskins, and we'll just figure out the rest of the game. So I get why they didn't pitch into him. And I, I understand the thought of, well, you should have at least thrown one up and in without actually hitting him. You know, to just send a message. What does that message do? Seriously. Do we really think that if if instead of throwing one on the black on the inside, which ended up getting hit by Hoskins and driving into, if he throws that six inches closer and he has to back up to get out of the way, is that really going to change Hoskins' mentality in the box? Hoskins likes to play the villain, and he completely got up for this game, and he delivered. I don't think that buzzing him once would have changed anything. I don't think hitting him would have necessarily meant that in the third inning he doesn't hit a home run on a hanging slider. I think regardless of if you hit him in the first inning or not, he's going to hit the hanging slider out. And for all we know, if you do hit him, well, for one, Johan Ramirez might be coming out of the bullpen in the first inning, and it could be even more of a disaster. But even if they keep him in the game, who knows what would have happened from there. So I I don't like the revisionist history on 
they should have hit him in the first inning. The whole game would have been different because to me, that's, you know, connecting dots in a very um, convenient way to fit the narrative that you, that you like now throwing at him in the seventh day with Johan Ramirez. Does that make the Mets look, look soft to do it after he'd already gone three for three driven in four hit a home run? Absolutely. Should they have done it then? No. Was it on purpose or an accident? Anyone's guess. Johan Ramirez does not always have the best control throughout his career. And maybe he knew what a big at bat it was for a guy that had killed him at that day. Maybe he didn't. Maybe it was simply just a complete misfire. And that's what Carlos Mendoza said, went to bat for his pitcher. Of course, what else is he going to say? That's even what um, the manager of the Brewers, Pat Murphy, said. He said, I don't think it was intentional. And Hoskins said after the game, you, you, you can't be a uh, you know, major leaguer shouldn't miss by eight feet. And you know what? If Pete Alonso's in the box and the exact same thing happened without even any of the other contacts attached to it, if he just was in the box, a reliever throws one behind him. We've seen this before where some of these guys who throw hard don't know where it's going. Always the fan base gets out outraged, as does everyone in that dugout, because you never want to see someone getting hurt. I honestly believe that that ball that sailed away from Johan Ramirez behind Hoskins' back was just the baseball gods having a sense of humor. But that would be the time against that dude for a ball to get completely away from him. And guess what happened? Ramirez got thrown out of the game. Do the Mets look good in this instance? Of course not. It's horrible optics. Should they have hit him in the first inning to get their retribution and to send a message? Maybe. But remember when Noah Syndergaard threw at Shea Sutley the first time they saw him again after the World Series? Early in the game, what happened? There was a something in a jackpot and all that other stuff that we all remember from Terry Collins' blow up and the umpire, that great clip. But if I'm not mistaken, Syndergaard was tossed from the game. You got to give us one. You got to give us one. You know what he did? It didn't matter. So I don't get the outrage against what happened from, from some Mets fans who think they should have done things differently. It's just not the way the game is played. Ultimately, you can't send messages that way anymore. And how you should have sent the message is you should have just got them out. And they couldn't do that throughout the game. Now, I will say this about Severino's first start in a Mets uniform. I think it looked a lot worse than it was. He gave up 12 hits, not good, but he didn't walk anybody. And he was still throwing hard. He still racked six strikeouts in those five innings. And there was a lot of you know, hits that I didn't feel like were necessarily um, well struck. He had some bad luck in that game and he didn't have a slider. I mean, that was clear. His slider did not get a single whiff. And I think the zone contact was a hundred percent. So if the slider was in the zone, they were hitting it. And so with that in mind, you know, it, it was just a bad day for him. Um, I would be more concerned if the fastball was what was getting teed off on. I think that the fact that he didn't have a slider to go to, that was really the issue. And I believe he can get that slider back. I think it was just a, a one day thing. And I believe you'll see a better version of Severino moving forward. Um, it was just a rough one for him. And, and like I said, you know, the 12 hits allowed don't look good. And he's got an ERA of 10.80 right now. Granted, if not for that ground ball that went off the heel of Zach Short's glove, was it the heel or the tip of his glove? Regardless, the, the grounder that Zach Short booted, he would have allowed three less earned runs because all those runs would have been unearned. Um, but whatever, doesn't matter. The point is, San Marino did not have his the best start in a Mets uniform, but I'm not overly concerned just yet that he can't figure it out. It's just baseball. And Reese Hoskins, at the end of the day, as much as you hate the guy, you got to tip the cap. He, he took the motivation and he had himself a hell of a game. Hopefully it's not a hell of a series and he does it again in the final game and the Mets can figure him out. But what I will say is at least this team showed some fight. At least they found their way back into the game. Brett Beatty with a monster home run. Francisco Alvarez had a clutch game. Pete Alonzo, a lot of good stuff to talk about that happened throughout. 
particularly towards the end of the game. I'll break all that down in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Brand new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 wins. It's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, and you can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You can also bet on baseball right now, back in season, so... If you want to take the over on Tyler McGill's strikeouts, and maybe you believe the Mets are going to win, you can combine that, put Francisco Lindor in the parlay as well, hit the over on his hits, and if the Mets have a nice day at the ballpark on Sunday, you'll win big. But remember, you want to place that $5 bet first to win $200 in bonus bets guaranteed to be used on point spreads, money lines, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It gets overshadowed due to all the drama surrounding Reese Hoskins as well as Luis Severino's poor debut, but the Mets had a really nice day offensively on Saturday. They had 12 hits, they scored six runs, and they battled back late to score four runs in the final two innings. Also, Francisco Alvarez had himself a game. He went three for four. He had a home run to get the Mets on the board in the uh, second inning. It was a hanging curveball. He crushed it. Hit it almost 110 miles per hour off the bat, 400 feet, just an absolute bomb. That got the Mets on the board. Then in the third inning, came right back around, had a runner in scoring position in Starling Marte, who had drawn a walk. Really nice at bat to get on base there. Jeff McNeil got a hit to advance Marte to third. And then it was Alvarez that drove him in with the base knock. So the first two runs were courtesy of Alvarez. And then the next three, which did not come until the eighth inning, courtesy of Brett Beatty. Beatty did not start in this game. Lefty on the mound, and Zach Short, I believe, was two for two against DL Hall in his career. So they went with Short for the matchup. He did get a hit his first at bat. He hit the ball hard in his first three at bats, although he only got that one hit. So I'm not going to say just because Brett Beatty came in and ended up facing a lefty and hit a three run homer that Short should not be playing in those situations. They got to get this guy some playing time. I get it coming against lefties early in the season. But hey, Brett Beatty, if you want to start every day, here's a, a good way to do it. Come into the game and face a left-handed pitcher, hit a three-run homer late. That might get you another look against lefties coming up so soon in the future here. So here's basically how it all went down in that eighth inning. So Starling Marte, who looks fantastic to begin this season, he gets a leadoff single. Jeff McNeil lines out. Francisco Alvarez, again, at the center of everything. He gets a base hit. So that puts runners at the corners. And with a righty on the mound, Carlos Mendoza grabs Beatty to pinch hit for Zach Short. Pat Murphy responds by going to grab Holby Milner out of the or Hobie Milner, excuse me, out of the bullpen. It's a funky lefty, throws from a weird angle, really tough on those left-handed batters. What does Brett Beatty do? Looking fastball first pitch, gets one on the inner half, does not miss it crushes it 108 off the bat 424 feet just demolishes that baseball hits a three on homer and was jacked up and you love to see it because this is the type of swing that can get Beatty comfortable early and I hope he has a big game on Sunday to follow this up and who knows maybe he becomes the hot hand and at that point May Mendoza just rides him but I, I gotta say it was such an awesome moment to see Beatty deliver in that spot and it, it does make you at least second guess not starting him against lefties when he can have a, a big, big at bat like that. Throughout his mild career, this was not a guy that you would have said you can't face him against any lefties. Now, last year, he struggled against everybody, but did struggle particularly against lefties. And I get from a roster construction perspective, wanting to give everybody time, letting someone like Zach Short get those starts against left handed pitching because Short all spring was swinging a good bat. And again, he looked very comfortable in the box in this game. But if Brett Beatty can put it all together this year and he's hitting so well where he's got you know an 800-plus OPS and he's driving the baseball, getting some home runs, eventually you can play yourself into an everyday role. And I honestly hope, too, that Mets fans aren't going to be pissed off every time that he's benched 
Um, because you also have to, it, you ha he has to earn that everyday role. And of course, if it's a soft tossing lefty, maybe there's times where you figure it out. You give Jeff McNeil a day and you start Zach short at second and you let Brett Beatty start that game. And he's obviously going to see some lefties throughout the game. I would not pinch hit um, Beatty out of the game for Zach short in the seventh inning of a game when a lefty is due to face him. I, I let him hit in those spots. So it's just pick and choosing, but regardless, awesome to see him deliver in that moment. Then the trumpets blared in the ninth inning for Edwin Diaz to come on and uh, you know, hold it down and, and, and keep the Mets within two. And he did exactly that. Great to see him you know, go out there and, and pitch on a city field mound again. And then we get to bottom of the ninth inning and Pete Alonzo comes up. He gets just a ridiculous pitch to Homer on 100 miles per hour on the outside black. Now it was up, but still 100 miles per hour on the black outside. It's one thing if he went with it, hit that down the right field line. But Pete Alonso is so damn strong that he just gets all of it, pulls it 113.8 miles per hour off the bat. 400 plus foot home run. So all three home runs by the Mets, 400 feet traveled um, on each of those in this game and gets the Mets within one. Unfortunately, DJ Stewart strikes out, Stanley Martha Marte strikes out, and that's the ball game. It's going to feel a lot better when you have JD Martinez up because maybe JD Martinez could do something after Alonzo. But you look at the Mets lineup in this game to put up six runs, to score four in the last two innings, it's a good sign for things to come. If it wasn't for you know Severino giving up the six runs, if it wasn't for Adam Adovino having a rough outing as well, three hits allowed, um, he did get two strikeouts but gave up a run in that uh, top of the eighth. That one run really ended up hurting the Mets. Maybe they win this game. Hoskins obviously killed them, but uh, I think there's a lot of promising things to take away from what the Mets did offensively, particularly Francisco Alvarez with a great game, how – fantastic Martez look through these first two games really does look himself and Pete Alonso, of course, being Pete Alonso as well as Brett Beatty with the, you know, shocking through and Homer off a lefty. If those things carry over. The Mets are going to eventually pitch a little bit better than they have. And I think they'll start to win some games. Of course, they're going to win games. So they're not going to go. zero and one sixty-two, and they'll probably win on Sunday. At least I hope you got Tyler McGill on the mound against Colin Rea. We'll see if the Mets can do something in this one. I'll be breaking that down on Monday's show. Uh, also, we will be previewing Eliza Head here uh, against the Detroit Tigers to start off this week. So make sure you tune in. If you are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're making a push to 9,000 subs. So make sure you, you subscribe. If you're uh, listening on the audio side, uh, follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Match your first listen every day. Now for your second listen or your second watch, head over to Locked On Sports today, the first ever 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports with our local experts on each team and our league-wide experts on each league. You can find Locked On Sports today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.